Good afternoon, everybody. Members of court and council, supporters, friends, partners, Imperial staff, students and alumni, a very warm welcome to Imperial College for the 2019 President's Address. I'm Philip Dilley, Chair of Imperial College Court and Council, which are, of course, the governing bodies of the college. This President's Address has become an important evening in the college's calendar. It's at this time, of course, we recognise and celebrate the external honours and accolades bestowed on a number of our members and people on the Imperial community over the past year. And of course, some of those are shown in the booklet that you have in front of you and on, on the screens. We've been very busy in our teaching, our research, and in our collaborations, the latter very much enabled by our fabulous new facilities at White City. The achievements we're celebrating tonight are listed in the booklet, as I say, and exemplify just some of the excellence that surrounds us here at Imperial. As many of you already know, we continue to deliver impactful, important research across science, engineering, medicine, and business. But one thing that's always impressed me is the way in which our networks of excellence bring together academics from different disciplines to research into a whole spread of global challenges, from food and nutrition to robotics. And it's that bringing together of disciplines that often brings about um, something that we wouldn't have seen so many years ago. Anyway, this evening is an opportunity for us all to hear from Alice and to reflect on opportunities and challenges ahead for Imperial, but also for higher education and indeed the world. So please all join me to welcome Imperial's president, Alice Gast, for her 2019 address. Alice. Thank you very much. Uh, Philip, and, uh, and welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. It's always wonderful to gather to celebrate the excellence around us, and I hope that you enjoyed reading uh, in the brochures and looking at the, uh, at the slides. Uh, we really have an amazing array of accolades, and uh, we have a lot to celebrate. And I hope that you'll join us in the reception afterwards where we can continue to celebrate these impressive colleagues. In celebrating these colleagues, it's interesting to note that the people we acknowledge for their awards, their external awards, come from more than 25 countries. So this leads naturally into my theme this year. We are international, and we will stay that way. I'm sure many of you remember your first international experience. I vividly remember my first days in Europe. I was ill when I landed in Athens. I stopped at a pharmacy and was surprised to get a medication that would only be available by prescription back home. Being an engineer helped me to decipher the Greek alphabet. I made my way to the suburbs with an address written on a paper plate, as students do. Every so often, I'd ask someone for directions, showing them my plate. They warmly helped me. I understood the direction they pointed. Friendly strangers pointing the way, it was sort of an early turn-by-turn -turn navigation long before Google Maps and Siri. I managed to find my group, and before I knew it, I was staying with a widowed yaya on a Greek island studying Greek language and mythology. I found out that my shower was a cold water douse over the toilet operated by pulling a chain. My yaya served me chamomile tea. I recovered, I learned some Greek, and I also learned a tremendous amount about people and about myself. After studying in Greece, I took the magic bus to Austria and traveled around Europe by train. I went to Italy to see Rome and Florence. I went to Germany because of my family roots. I went to Spain because I studied Spanish in school. And I ended my travels in London, expecting to understand the language. <laughs> the friendly waiter serving breakfast cautioned me to take a brawly, as it was likely to be wet. The weather did not disappoint. It rained. I became a different person that summer. My eyes, my mind, and my heart were opened to the world. 
One thing that struck me then and has always resonated is how much we have in common with people no matter where we're from. We all care for family and friends and sometimes even for strangers asking directions. We share the desire for a good future. We appreciate a thing of beauty, a flower, a sunset, an adorable child, a cat. We have a common curiosity about others and about faraway places. We thrive when we explore. Our similarities are complemented by our differences. Each of us have worldviews shaped by our families, our experiences, our schools, and the local culture where we grew up. Spending my postdoctoral year in France opened my eyes to how these differences are beneficial when we work together. Sitting down to tackle a complex problem in condensed matter physics, I found my French colleagues taking a different approach from mine. While I was ready to dive into solving some differential equations, they sharpened their pencils, took out a clean sheet of paper, and framed the problem in an elegant and simple way. And they evaluated what needed to be done. Our complementary strengths, when combined, augmented our work. We did not always agree with one another. In fact, sometimes the greatest discoveries come from disagreement. Collaboration is important, not only across disciplines, but across cultures. It brings new insights, leads to new approaches, and to new discoveries. I sometimes make the analogy between collaboration across cultures and the hybrid vigor or beneficial qualities that come from crossbreeding. Many of you have experienced this hybrid vigor in your collaborations and in your own research groups. One need only to look at the award-winning work across Imperial to see the qualities our diverse community brings to us and to society. We are truly international. Over the past decade, we have collectively collaborated with peers in 192 countries, and more than half of our research papers have international co-authors. On our website, you can find a wonderful map showing these collaborations. This is some 105,000 research papers. Almost two-thirds of our corporate research comes from collaborations with businesses outside the UK. Our students come from more than 130 countries. Our diverse international research collaborations and our own international community produce breakthroughs benefiting us locally, regionally, and throughout the world. Here are a few examples. Recently, I had the privilege of hearing Professor Elio Riboli eloquently describe his work to a group of friends and supporters. Thanks to support by the EU and the World Health Organization, Elio leads one of the largest cancer cohort studies in the world following more than half a million participants from 10 European countries for over 20 years. The European Perspective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition, or EPIC, is showing that a diet based on fruit, vegetables, whole grains, and moderate consumption of poultry and fish reduces risk of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. Our new School of Public Health in White City will bring this international approach to West London, where over 120 languages are spoken in communities having a variety of traditions, cultures, and ethnic backgrounds. Another multinational group, Natural Bionics, led by Professor Dario Farina, combines his expertise in neural interfaces with experts in neurosurgery at the University of Vienna and robotic specialists at the Italian Institute of Technology to take prosthetic technology into a new era. Funded by a European Research Council Synergy Grant, they are developing prosthetics that allow users to feel and command them as part of their body. 
The multidisciplinary and multicultural connections are literally helping us to improve connections between the brain, spinal cord, and prosthetic limbs. Professor Molly Stevens leads a group of bioengineers, material scientists, chemists, surgeons, and biologists from over 25 countries. They work with partners in the United States, South Africa, and Australia to engineer human bone, liver, and pancreas for autogalous transplantation. Their different cultural and disciplinary perspectives have helped the Stevens Group transform the development of biosensors and brought bioengineering approaches to regenerative medicine. Professor of Sustainable Chemical Technology, Jason Hallett, loves how his multinational group bring their, pers their personal history wherever they go. New ideas, contacts, and cultures improve the whole group and enhance their work. He says, by far the easiest way to cross-fertilize ideas is to hire people from other places, especially those with different research backgrounds. Thanks in part to their group members, their vaccine work has made its way to India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and China. Hallett's Swiss PhD student won a We Innovate Prize for Chrysalix technology. Their BioFlex process transforms waste wood into material for fuel. When they couldn't find the right hardwood in Europe, a fellow group member helped source it from China. Today, while the U.S. is building a wall with Mexico and the U.K. is likely departing from the EU, it is especially important to remember that immigration is an integral part of both countries' history. The U.K. has benefited from waves of immigration throughout history, from the earliest settlers through recent recruits. Shakespeare's London was multicultural and multiracial, including many North and West Africans as well as Europeans. The Huguenots came to Britain in the 17th and 18th century and brought with them many capabilities in science, banking, weaving, and glassmaking. Appropriately, our major partnership with CNRS of France is named after Abraham de Moivre, a Huguenot mathematician who came to England. After two world wars, immigration was essential to rebuilding the UK. Our infrastructure was built by people from Europe, the West Indies, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Today, this diversity is part of what makes the UK the success that it is. The effect of immigration on Imperial has been just as profound over the years. Decades before our 1907 founding, in 1845, Professor August Wilhelm von Hoffmann was recruited from Germany to be the first director of the newly created Royal College of Chemistry by none other than Prince Albert himself. Hoffman made significant contributions to synthetic chemistry and he mentored exceptional students. One of his students, William Henry Perkin, discovered movine and started the synthetic dye industry. You could say that modern international collaboration was born in our neighborhood. Prince Albert had the vision to open the 1851 Great Exhibition to the world. The possessions and innovations from more than 40 countries were represented in this first World's Fair. Over four million people from around Britain and the world arrived in London. That was over 50% more than the previous year. We are a legacy of the Great Exhibition, and Imperial was international from its beginnings. By 1925, nearly a fifth of our students came from abroad. Several of our Nobel laureates were foreign born. At the Denis Gabor lecture, honoring our Hungarian Nobel laureate, we learned how his writing, research, and his teaching influenced the world. Gabor moved to Imperial in 1958, and his pioneering development of holography was represented with the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1971. 
Today, we are the first university to use holographic technology to connect our business school to people around the world. His phrase, the future cannot be predicted, but futures can be invented, is just as apt today as when he wrote it in 1963. Sir Ernst Chain first came to the UK in 1933 and developed the unique freeze drying method to purify and concentrate penicillin. His 1945 Nobel Prize with Alexander Fleming and Howard Florey celebrated the discovery and production of penicillin. Coming to Imperial in 1961, Chain founded and chaired our biochemistry department and helped make the Wolfson Laboratories one of the leading research centers in the field. Our international alumni and students are innovators and entrepreneurs as well. This international flow of talent has always gone both ways. Many early 20th century students, such as Herbert Wright, moved abroad to conduct research into rubber in Ceylon and Malaya. His important and lucrative inventions propelled the emerging rubber industry. In the late 1930s, Hiru Patel, Hiru Patel undertook the long journey on foot, by plane and boat, from India to London, where he began studying mechanical engineering. His PhD thesis in aeronautics developed our understanding of flutter, the unstable oscillations on the wing of an aircraft during flight. He returned to India as a proud alumnus and became a pioneer in the plastics industry. In 2016, thanks to his family's generosity, we celebrated the Dr. Hiralal N. Patel wind tunnel and gave him a new copy of his PhD thesis still relevant 75 years after it was published. I often hear people talking about the successes of the Silicon Valley or the Boston area. What is the key to success in these areas? One element is that American entrepreneurs are working side by side with or often led by foreign born talent. 43% of the Fortune 500 companies were started by immigrants and their children. And 20% of the world's tech founders are immigrants, even though immigrants only make up around 4% of the world's population. If we are serious about achieving the UK's industrial strategy and eager to develop new enterprises in the UK, our new immigration system must be welcoming to international talent. At MIT, I did an informal study of our patent data and found that foreign students filed more patents than their domestic counterparts. This entrepreneurial strength is shared by foreign staff and students here at Imperial, where they are also more likely to file patents than their UK peers. In our enterprise lab for student entrepreneurs, 70% of the participants are foreign students. European students are twice as likely than others at Imperial to become student entrepreneurs. On a recent visit to our White City incubator, I talked to the founders of Custom Mem, who are making absorbent materials to rid water of chemical pollutants. They have rapidly grown to 10 employees one of them was born in the UK. Our We Innovate Awards last week, right in this very room, showcased five finalist female entrepreneurs with amazing pitches. They and their teams came from 11 countries. Why is this the case? Why are immigrants overrepresented as entrepreneurs, as tech founders, as corporate leaders? I have always thought that students who travel far away from home are already risk takers. They are immersed in a culture that is different from theirs, and they take in new ideas rapidly and readily. We have such risk takers in Imperial. International innovators are improving lives, creating jobs, and making the world a better place. Some of them have stayed in London. 
Like Hiru Patel 80 years before, Malav Sangavi came to Imperial from in India and he is now saving lives. Working in the Dyson School, Malav set out to solve a problem in neonatal survival in his home country. He founded Life Cradle to create a neonatal incubator that is 90% less expensive than existing incubators and can be used as a cot when the incubation is no longer needed. Malav is a serial entrepreneur. He is now running two companies in London. One day, we need not worry about being hit by an autonomous vehicle if our alumnus from the Netherlands has his way. Leslie Newtonboom is staying in London to develop humanizing autonomy to help autonomous vehicles better predict human behavior, such as jaywalking pedestrians. There are many more such examples, and we need to craft our immigration policies to encourage more of them to stay. There are also many who leave London and the UK. They take with them their formative experiences at Imperial and they remain global citizens and they improve the world around them. You can see this in the thriving entrepreneurial community in Shenzhen, where many of the entrepreneurial entrepreneurs you will meet are Imperial alumni. From wineries in Western Australia to tech startups in California, our alumni are talented, innovative, and, and entrepreneurial. We need to stay connected and to ensure that they have opportunities to come back. There is a long history of scientists working across borders, even during times of conflict. The Royal Society of London appointed its first foreign secretary in 1723, long before the British government did. CERN was established in 1954 and played an important role in rebuilding relationships that had been divided by the war. Likewise, Sesame, a synchrotron for the Middle East, modeled on and supported by CERN, opened in 2017. Sesame won the AAAS Award for Science Diplomacy this year. In addition to supporting research in environment and health, Sesame will foster peace and international collaboration. The reality of science diplomacy or more broadly, academic diplomacy, is that academics can and will work across political and cultural differences. In 2010, I was privileged to be named a US science envoy to Central Asia and the Caucasus. Wherever I traveled, I was warmly welcomed by the scientists, academics, community members, and fellow university leaders that I met. I will never forget the impressive young people who came to my chai chat in Tashkent with interesting questions and exciting ideas. Science diplomacy needs nurturing. I'm very pleased to have been asked by the Minister for University Science Research and Innovation to chair the Newton Prize Committee. And I'm very pleased to help with this important mission to recognize excellent science research and innovation in support of economic development and social welfare in Newton Fund partner countries. A network of respect and collegiality connects universities, laboratories, and research groups. It is true that through our common search for discovery and our common language, academics and scientists can indeed be great diplomats. I believe that this is still true today and is more important than ever. I am proud that Imperial is making international engagement a high priority. We have new and growing collaborations in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and are augmenting and strengthening our collaborations in Europe and the Americas. What does the future hold and what can we do? The operative word of the day is uncertainty. We have unclear futures before us. 
we see shifting policies and politics around the world. We must not and we will not let the uncertainties of these times distract us from the important work before us. Our international engagements make us stronger and we will continue to build them. We will not relent in our quest to keep our doors open to students, collaborators, and colleagues from around the world. In terms of the immediate issues of Brexit, we are witnessing unprecedented political turmoil and uncertainty. We must lift EU research collaborations out of politics. And I'll repeat, we must lift research out of politics. If there can be side deals for fisheries, there can be agreements for research collaboration for students and staff mobility. In my view, these agreements should apply in two primary areas. First, mobility of our colleagues and students, and second, fostering and supporting our collaborations around the world. So first, regarding mobility. In order for academics and scientists to be excellent entrepreneurs, collaborators, and diplomats, they need the ability to work together across borders. We must be ambitious in liberating mobility for academics and students. A 2017 poll showed that 86% of the British public want to increase or maintain levels of migration of scientists and researchers. We must seize this sentiment as we design a new post-Brexit immigration system. I applaud the new two-year startup visa. Extending the duration of the graduate entrepreneur visa is long overdue and is a welcome step towards our shared goal of making the UK a haven for entrepreneurs. Just this afternoon, the chancellor announced PhD level roles would be exempt from visa caps and that overseas research activity will count towards residents when applying for settlement in the UK. These are positive steps for science and research. But we can and we must be bolder. Here are three ideas. First, invite and welcome exceptional talent. Create a single tier one visa for exceptional researchers PhD students, and graduate entrepreneurs. A single route for all academic and entrepreneurial talent and removing number caps for all. This would serve as a clarion call to make the UK a beacon for talent. Second, make it easier for talented immigrants. Liberate visa sponsorship to allow trusted university employers to sponsor talented staff. Grant automatic visa sponsorship to all recipients of major international research funding, such as from the Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation, or the ERC. Allow the visa to follow the researchers so they can move from one sponsor to another. And lower salary thresholds for tier two skilled migrant visas for talented staff like our technicians. <laughs> Third, benefit from graduates' talent. Post-study work visas for all undergraduates and postgraduates with a duration of two years for STEM graduates will help meet the UK's 1.5 billion pound skills shortage. It will future-proof businesses as they adapt to a rapidly changing economy In this rapidly changing economy, STEM skills are increasingly valid. This will put us on a level playing field with competitors like the US. And sec the second area we need to bolster is supporting collaborations. 
We will continue to establish partnerships and collaborations in Europe and throughout the world. We call upon government to expand opportunities to support international students and scholars and to foster and fund international collaborations. Finally, we will vigorously defend our right to collaborate with international partners. Apart from national security concerns or government restrictions, we will work with others who share our commitment to furthering research, education, and science diplomacy, no matter where they are from, no matter what their current government has done, and no matter what others are accusing them of. We are international. Our international community, our collaborations, our partnerships, and our own experiences in other cultures and places have an immeasurable and profound effect on the world. We have a great heritage of mixing people, views, ideas, and cultures to create wonderful discoveries and insights. We must ensure that that mixing continues for our benefit and for the benefit of society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice, for another fantastically stimulating address. You've pointed out some of Imperial's many achievements to date, but also you've highlighted several of the opportunities and potential challenges ahead. I only wish some of our politicians were able to hear about the value and crucial importance of collaboration to us, yes, but also to the country. I know you tell them very regularly, so that some of them hear it. So anyway, thank you. It was very, very uh, enjoyable to listen to. I should also thank all of you, um, our friends and colleagues, for coming tonight but more importantly, for whatever you've done for the college, and indeed for whatever you're planning still to do, because I know some of you have uh, good things in mind. But all, what you do helps make Imperial such a success, so thanks to all of you. Um, you're invited now, as Alice has already mentioned, to join us in the main entrance just outside here for the President's Address Reception. Please join us. <laughs>